Hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Waters. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing for CGIS. And uh, once again, we're excited to be able to share some of our knowledge and our experience with you today. Um, CGIS has been in the valve business directly for over 40 years and indirectly since 1965. Our beginnings pushed us into the scene where valve technology was definitely evolving. Uh, Howard Freeman, inventor of the Teflon seated floating ball valve, provided the world with a better height isolation valve, uh, the James Bree. We used this valve and a few others like Joseph Way to create better control processes and kept pushing us into more challenging applications where isolation mattered. Now, more than 40 years after we bought into CGIS from our parent company, um, we are still evolving into a hybrid consultant, manufacturer, distributor, and where valve knowledge is key pillar uh, for all of our offers. Uh, we endeavor through our social purpose and corporate values to continue to educate ourselves and our communities so that we can continue to push for better results for our customers. Uh, today's presentation, we will focus um, on some misperceptions in the industry around isolation valves and specifically around the seat and shell leakage seen in many of these products. Uh, this is a very large topic, obviously, and uh, we'll touch on some of the standard tests we see in North America. Uh, for valve manufacturers and hopefully bring to light why some of uh, your isolation valves leak even before they're installed in the pipeline. Uh, we'll scratch the surface on some solutions, but ideally by giving you more knowledge on the subject, allow you as end users and engineers to be aware of potential pitfalls when specifying and selecting products uh, to allow you to be aware of the nuances that really matter in your application. Uh, next slide, Ben. Perfect, so just some housekeeping. Um, we like to keep this interactive. Um, as you know, our knowledge is uh, further extended through lessons learned and by working closely with clients like you. Uh, so we do ask for questions. Uh, we'll try, I'll be monitoring the chat box so at the bottom of uh, the call there, you'll see a chat box. Uh, please feel free to enter your questions there. I will definitely try to get to them at the end of uh, the presentation. Otherwise, if you do prefer, we can um, uh, take this offline and uh, Ross, Ben and myself will have our contact information up at the end of the slides and uh, you can definitely reach out to us and we'd be happy to uh, discuss any of the, uh, the information here further. All right, next slide, Ben. All right, perfect. So to, uh, to take us to, to today's presentation, we got two of our uh, technical experts. Uh, Ross, uh, Ross has been involved with Valve since he was 11. <laughs> he was, uh, and now he's trying to pay back the industry by improving experience for Valve users and owners. Uh, Ross is an active member of ASTM and MSS and brought forth the need for a standard for severe service valves in the industry, which is in the final stages of completion through MSS. Ross has been an active participant in industry conferences around the world and are recognized uh, by many as the Valve King. Uh, ben is a graduate from Queen's University with a degree in chemical engineering. Ben is one of our severe service application specialists within CGIS. Uh, he has been with the company for 15 years now and recently moved into an inside-outside combined role, uh, which really gives him not only an insight into the customer's uh, needs from the inside, but also some first-hand uh, knowledge and, uh, and how valves function in the field. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to the two uh, panelists and uh, go from there. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks very much, Brendan. Okay. So, um... I'm gonna get started with um, just a bit of background. So um, there's a general misperception in the market that most or all isolation valves isolate perfectly out of the factory. But the fact is that not all valve types or makes of the same type can isolate perfectly. And to complicate matters, we don't even have a universal definition of perfect isolation. That's the least of which is when it's in service. It's one, one thing when it's being tested in the factory is very different once it's in service. So let's revisit isolation in its most prim primitive form. An isolation valve is required to stop the flow of an upstream process from traveling past the valve's closure member to a downstream position. There are other forms of process escaping the containment, and this needs to be understood and specified, such as fugitive emissions, but isolation is principally about shut off, and, that, and this is what we're gonna delve deeper into today. So isolation past the seating member of the valve. Many styles of isolation valves were invented 150 years ago during the Industrial Revolution. And, um, but there's been very few modern designs since the 1960s, which were the golden age of valve invention. And the latest variants of these valves developed in the 1960s are now at least 30 years old. So relying on the past may be safe, 
but it isn't necessarily best practice. So we need to know which valves to use when and when, which isolation classes to specify when. How do we know that? There's no universal agreed upon definition of the applications which will require more stringent specifications. How tight is tight? Is some through leakage okay? And so when do we specify that? But what we like to say is that the application dictates the valve. It is critical to understand and convey the expectations of how the valve will perform and how it will perform not just on day one, but after years in the service. Probably the most common tool uh, for, for a purchaser to uh, convey to the supplier what the requirements are and the expectations of the valve is a, is a data sheet, very common to most, probably all of us. So I'm going to quickly go through a couple of uh, data sheets just in high level to illustrate some key pieces of information and maybe some pitfalls and, um, and some things that we, we very commonly see. So I'm just going to jump into a couple of data sheets to, um, to highlight this. So um, here's a pretty standard data sheet. Uh, what jumps out at me here is comparing the application of thick and tailings isolation valve against the specified leakage class of class four. So class four is referring to uh, the FCI 70-2 standard. Um, and I'll discuss this a bit further later on, but they're essentially not for isolation valves. They're for modulating valves. And class four allows for a significant amount of leakage. Maybe in some cases that's okay, but I would venture to guess thick and tailings isolation valve at high pressures requires better than class four leakage. So in my opinion, this standard should never be used as a leakage standard for isolation valves and is a pitfall in this otherwise quite, quite good data sheet. Um, so here's another one. This is, uh, this is an older data sheet. This is, um, goes back to 2000. And actually the, the specifier had some um, experience that led them to update their data sheet and provide some very useful information. Because of some um, failures they saw prior to this data sheet that being released. So the thing that they're providing to me here that I find very valuable is this frequency of operation. That's essential to selecting the right valve technology. In addition, it would be valuable to have the normal op operating position open or closed. Um, so there's four different states in an isolation valve in its life in any time that it, that it exists. It's either open, moving from open to close, closed, or moving from closed to open. So for a valve that will stroke very infrequently, some considerations must be taken. Perhaps you all, you'll need to increase the actuator size in order to break through any scale or the, the seats becoming sort of uh, fixed in where they are. So that's a consideration for infrequently stroking. Conversely, for a valve that will stroke very often, there's other considerations we need to, to consider, so, like maybe upgrading the trim or upgrading the seals to handle those uh, high cycles or upgrading the actuation as well. Um, one small snag on this status sheet is that they don't tell us what type of bidirectional isolation is required. So what standard does that need to be tested to? So it's a little bit, uh, it's not discreet enough, but it definitely understood of what, uh, what the specifier is trying to get at. Okay, so here's another one. Um, again, it's nicely describing the valve performance, zero leakage bidirectional. I think that's fairly easy to understand, but it's not discreet enough again because what test is that being, being done to? There may be some additional requirements in the back end of the specifications, but to have it on the data sheet is, is gonna ensure you get the right thing more often than not. <clears throat> Here, the, um, the cold reality of this is that <clears throat> this application is, is absolutely a severe service application, very rarefied, very challenging. And here to have this wish, this is what we want it to, to do is great. However, the reality here in this case, when it started up um, in, a, in a mine or a mineral processing plant more accurately, it survived only 17 weeks. And this was not just one valve, it was several. And so the cost of the, um, the, the downtime was the severe uh, issue here. We tested the valve properly or it was tested properly to a requirement of zero leakage, but in, in actual fact, it failed to last more than 17 weeks, causing three to four days of downtime on, a, on one of the main uh, construction parts of the process, which is the autoclave. There's five autoclaves. So when it failed, it took 
one of those autoclaves down 20% of the production, the fact that they all failed on average every 17 weeks for three days was an enormous sum of money that added up to around $12 million in lost production. So uh, the point is here is that we really need to focus on how do we get that required uh, um, performance of a valve into the valve for its actual life. Into the application. Yeah. And here's, uh, here's another example. This one is quite good. Um, so um, the data sheet provides critical information. So it's telling me again here the bidirectional bubble pipe and it's this time telling me as per API 598. Okay, well, that's useful. And then this information here, um, it's not highlighted, but it's uh, the fields are scaling potential, corrosion potential, erosion potential, and abrasive potential. Um, this really assists in being able to understand the pitfalls that the valve may experience when it's actually in line, doing its job of being open or closed or moving between those two positions. Um, so, I think what I take away from that is they're, they're giving me a, a lot of information to make suitable selections, not just to meet the bidirectional per API 598, which is a test that happens at the factory and is a snapshot in time when the valve is in its best condition, but telling me the information that I need to be considering and making the correct selections for all of the, 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 the specific valve type or the designs around in that valve type, but also all of the options that are available. Um, the valve, the valve is going to have a tough life, I can see, because of there's some you know, scaling and abrasion. So the process can have a de degrading effect on a, a valve's ability to isolate in service. And a small amount of leakage initially can and will have a compounding effect on the installed leakage rate over time. A small amount of leakage today is not necessarily a small amount of leakage in a month or a year. Again, I don't have the normal operating position. Is it normally open or normally closed? Which, especially for scaling, is a critical piece of information for me to make some, uh, some good assertions on the, the selection of the valve and the actuation. So we, we, we've learned along the way um, how to really delve into these details. And this picture for me is a really, um, really good one because everyone can see that there is something happening downstream of the of the isolation valve and it's not good. In this case, this valve um, is in Northern Canada. The ambient temperature for seven months of the year is below zero, below zero water freezes. That whitish object inside the pipe, that's water. Where did it come from? It came from inside the tank. What is the valve duty? The, du the duty of that valve is to drain the tank. You can for sure guarantee that that valve will open today. This is in February of 1999, minus 43 degrees out there. Uh, you, we can open that valve, it will open, but the tank will not drain because the allowable leakage rate of that valve was such that it dewatered, allowed the water to come out, freeze and make an iceberg. The problem there was trying to describe what was needed with tools that weren't completely developed. And when we looked at the data sheet, we made, a, we made an error. We bid a valve that was designed to not do that, but we didn't get the order because we didn't bid what they asked for. They asked for this. This was a class, well, this was an MSS SP81 knife gate valve made by a, a proper manufacturer, made well. It's not a bad valve. It's just the wrong valve for this application for seven months of the year. In the summertime, when it was above zero, the leakage could be accepted. Maybe not perfect, but it could be accepted. The, the valve would open and drain the tank if necessary. This problem started the, the impetus for us to look at the industry itself and try to get rid of some of the subjective language that was riddling it for years and years and years. When I grew up, we used terms like high performance valve and tight shut off. They sounded good. We felt comfortable with them. We use them ourselves without really understanding well, how high is high, how tight is tight. After many years of understanding that and seeing where the problem was, it was a problem of, of delivering a message. I decided uh, to write a paper defining objectively what these things meant. And it started in 2014, was accepted by MSS in 2015 as a project. And uh, I think as we earlier alluded to, it's close to getting published. There's always some issues with trying to get 100% agreement in the industry. And to be honest, I looked at it as three different criticalities of valves. 
severe service being the most important, general purpose being the ones in the middle, and commodities being in the bottom, where it's if a failure happens, it's not going to have a huge uh, concern to anybody. But at the end of the day, we agreed that uh, the com commodity name might not be seen as friendly to a couple of manufacturers. So we replaced commodity with general purpose and we moved general purpose uh, to a fit for purpose into the middle category. So we're doing that because we want everybody to agree on a, a common language, an objective common language that doesn't have all these pitfalls of saying, hey, it's tight shut off. What does tight mean? We'll, we'll explore this as we go through today's meeting. Next slide. Okay, so what we're, <clears throat> what we're really going to be talking about um, is the, the, the seat leakage. But before we get there, I just want to go over some of the other things that can happen to a valve. And one uh, body leak you see there, it's a very rare time when you ever have a problem with the body of a, of a well-made valve uh, is, is damaged and that you're going to get process loss of containment. The other area that we do have more concern is the stem leak, which we will identify as fugitive emissions and probably a great topic for a future webinar. But for now, we're, um, we're just going to bring it up as this is a, a, another area where process uh, containment can be lost, but it's called the fugitive emissions. The, the goal of our meeting today is to understand what happens when the valve is closed and the seat or the, uh, the seat trim, the obturators, the parts that make the valve stop the leakage don't do it in a perfect way and you got leakage downstreams. So those are the areas that we're really going to, um, to delve into and to understand and to find out, can we get zero leakage, uh, some, some better definition of, of uh, performance? The answer is yes, we can from a practical point of view, we can get uh, practical, perfect isolation. Can we get it in every case all the time forever? No, no, this is uh, always gonna be some uh, possibility that that perfect isolation is never going to be achievable for a, for a long, long time. But from a practical perspective, for years, for decades, in some applications, and certainly in, in easier ones, the, the um, general purpose ones, we can do that um, much more easily than we can on some of the very challenging applications that are found in industry today. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, now I'm just going to go through some of the common valve standards and um, go into suitable amount of detail on them. Um, I can't delve too deep just because uh, well, for one, they'd be too dry, but also um, there, there is, there's a lot of information in them. With any standards, there is, there, the details must be adhered to. So um, the test standards have been established to pro provide uniformity. However, there isn't even uniformity, there's uneven uniformity, I suppose you could say, between the different standards. And therefore, decisions must be made by the manufacturer and the purchaser as to which one is adopted for use and which one is best. I don't think there is. There's, there's not a best standard, but there is better standards. There's more applicable standards for what, uh, what one is trying to do. And uh, really, it still comes down to specifying the correct valve or the correct valve technology for the application. Um, the top four here are the most common standards seen in industry. Okay. So those are API 598, MSS SB61, ANSI FCI 70-2, ranging from class one to class six, often referred to as, and I mentioned briefly earlier, and the ISO standard 5208, which gives the rates A to rate G. And then, um, and then there's these other, other standards, which, um, which generally refer back to the top standards for leakage, or are specific to individual valve types. If you have five many fours for check valves, 609 for butterfly valves, and then these MSS standards are for different uh, flavors of knife gate valves. Um, B1634 is um, valve pressure ratings, and you'll find that most of the standards refer back to that standard, and B1634 in turn refers back to API 598. There's other standards like API 6A and 6D, which I do uh, touch on. And again, a lot of them are, are speaking back to each other. So the API 6D, for instance, will reference back to ISO 5208. The standards are generally reissued every four years, and it's the specifier and manufacturer's responsibility to ensure the most current standards are being used. <clears throat> so um, among the pressure testing, um, there are some commonalities. 
The seat leakage test is often, not always, but often done at 110% of the rated pressure. And similarly, the shell test is often done at 150% of the rated pressure. The test media is normally water or a clean gas, and the temperature is normally ambient or maximum of 100 F, 38 C. Um, but you'll note that these, all these conditions, including the duration, they're all, um, they're all very ideal. They're all known. They're in a clean environment, a clean factory, and right after the valve has been built. Um, so they're not indicative of what the valve will be experiencing when installed. And I think that's just important to understand that, you know, the test is, is not what the valve will be seeing. So again, yeah, that application must dictate the valve. Um, across the standards, soft seated valves are generally required to be zero leakage. And we're going to see that again and again in the standards I'm going to go through here. Um, metal seated valves generally, but not always, have an allowable leakage. So this is where a specifier must be aware and discreet about the expectations of the valve. With soft seated, is, there's a lot less ambiguity, but metal seated is definitely where we need to, um, to have, our, um, have our alerts on to make sure we're, we're specifying things properly. <clears throat> so how do you pick what the right, right test is? Here's an example of um, uh, an eight inch class 150 wedge gate valve. Now, um, maybe it's not realistic to be comparing that with a metal seat and a resilient seat because it's not a resilient seated valve. And I said wedge gate, but it would be the same for any, um, any metal seated valve. Um, and these are the leakage rates on day one, they're allowable at the factory. The valve has a leakage rate, but they're allowable or not, allowable or not. if there's differential pressure across the valve, the leak rate will likely increase over time. So, and one thing in this, uh, this chart, that I'd just like to draw your attention to, is the fact that the FCI 70-2 class five rate is actually less than the class six rate. And um, that's just a function of how the, the test parameters are defined with respect to the pressures that are being used and, and also the media that needs to be used between those. So we'll talk about that a bit more later on. And there's numerous different charts and, um, and collateral that we have available that sort of compare the different test standards, um, but didn't wanna clutter up the, um, the present unit presentation too much with some of that, but we can definitely get, uh, get comparison tables uh, for anybody who's interested. Um, and in the resources section, there's some, there's some very good information that will, uh, will be provided to everybody. So um, let's um, go through those top four specifications that I mentioned. So I'm gonna go through uh, those in, in the order that they were stated there. So API 598 testing. Um, it's one of the most widely used and accepted valve testing standards. The scope is broad and encompasses gate, globe, plug, ball, check, butterfly, and any other valves as agreed between the manufacturer and purchaser. Um, so the shell test. The shell test is a pressure test in excess of the cold working pressure. So CWP referred to as cold working pressure rating of the valve for the purposes of validating the soundness and strength of the valve pressure containing structures. Um, so this is, what Ross was saying, eliminating body leaks, essentially. So API 598 requires this test to be at 150% of the valve's rated pressure, commonly seen for um, in commissioning as well. There's also an allowance for a backseat test. Um, this is specifically done on gate and globe valves. And what they're doing is they're testing the valve with the packing bolts loosened or removed in order to um, verify there's no leakage past the stem or the shaft while the valve is being repacked. So it's uh, that, that's leakage to atmosphere and making sure that that can be done with the um, packing bolts loosened or removed. And then next there is closure test. So the closure test or the seat test, which is what um, Ross was talking about and said is what we're most interested in here um, for this presentation. So it's used to confirm leakage past or through a valve's closure mechanism. And in the specification, they refer to it as the obdurator. Depending on the valve type, low and or high pressure closure tests are required, or you know, they're, they're optional at the purchaser's request. So the standard is requiring um, their, the leakage to be visually detectable. So um, that's either past a pressure boundary or a closure member. So it's all, it's all visual based. 
Um, the location of the testing is done at the manufacturer's facility. And like I mentioned, does not equate to the same performance once it's installed and operational. Um, so once um, valves are tested at the factory, they obviously require generally to be tested once they're in the field, so a commissioning test. And, uh, and I came across one case recently where the valve was being tested um, during commissioning and they wanted to test it to 150 percent of the rate of pressure but it was there was a common header and so they were looking to isolate use this isolation valve closed and test the piping system up to 150 percent of the pressure kind of using it as a line break really but that it was just something that showed me that it wasn't a clear understanding of what's capable what the valve is capable and designed to and and what um, the maybe the requirements are to use the valve instead of using a blind. So in that case, if the valve was tested with the closure member um, fully shut to 150% of the maximum pressure, that could potentially um, blow out the seals or cause um, irreparable damage or and and or uh, void of the warranty. So it's just understanding what the expectations of the valve are and um, and what can be achieved. So um, the API 598 pressure testing is split into two tables, as shown above here. Basically, table one is for smaller sizes and lower pressure classes, and table two is for larger sizes and higher pressure classes. So four, four inches where it's uh, del being delineated, and uh, the pressure classes are different based on that. So that's just some detail to, to be aware of. But in reviewing these tables, You'll notice that the shell and back seat tests remain consistent regardless of the size and pressure class. So these first two rows here. Um, but the closure tests differ quite a lot. And in many instances, they're actually reversed between what is required and what is optional. So on um, higher pressure or, or larger valves, the low pressure tests are, depending on the size, more likely to be optional. So this is something that's just important to understand what the application is. Um, for some valve designs, it is easier to pass a high pressure closure test and harder, harder to pass a low pressure closure test. For instance, a floating ball valve. It needs that energy within, within the piping system to seat it against the, um, the, the mating seat. So, you know, um, there's a lot of optional things in there. There's a lot of things that the purchaser can say, I want this to be done. And that's well within um, everybody's rights. So at, at CGIS, we look for manufacturers who standardize on more stringent test requirements. This is more notable for ball valves and triple offset valves. And that's to test at both the low and high pressures, even though they're only optional to the letter of the standard. But um, if that's being done, we're, we're confident that the level of quality of the product is likely to be at or above uh, competing products. Um, so speak to the shell testing in uh, API 598. It's um, performed at the pressures as shown here on, in table three. For iron valves, these ones here, uh, there are specific pressures that are called out within the standard. For steel valves, notes B and C are applicable and that's basically um, saying that the applicable pressure rating needs to be complied with and that's generally as per ASME B16.34. Um, as with most of the standards, the shell testing is to be done at 1.5 times the valve pressure rating rounded up to the ne next higher 25 PSI increment. So for ASME B16.34 group 1.1 materials, and that includes um, A216WCB or the for its equivalent A105, um, and for class 150, that those materials are rated to 285 PSI at 38C, so tested at 1.5 times, rounded up, is 450 PSI for the pressure testing. Whereas, say, group 2.2 materials, which is another common material, CF8M or 316 stainless steel, has a slightly lower pressure rating, 275 PSI, so as a result, the pressure it's gonna be tested to on the shell is 25 PSI less as per the standard. So really the point here is that the test pressure is dependent on the material and 
we should also note that some materials aren't even listed in ASME B1634. An example would be titanium. So how do you know what you'll get? And really, the standards aren't telling you what to do. And so the answer is that you need to ask. You need to you know, be sure that what you're getting is, is uh, what, what you expect and what your, your valve will be seeing in service. Using that titanium as an example, there's different grades of titanium. And the pressure ratings across those grades can be vastly different. The alloying compounds in them can add a significant amount of strength. So uh, this is just something that, uh, that is important to be aware of. And the test pressure is not the test pressure for a given class. It definitely has to rely on the, the material as well. So also for shell testing, it just should be noted that uh, the valve should be open or partially open um, when that testing is done. You're not testing the closure member. And if you did at 150% of the pressure rating, you, um, you may blow out some seals, as I alluded to in that uh, commissioning story there. Um, so the acceptance criteria for the shell testing is no visible leakage through the boundary. So it's all visible. Um, oops, what our eyes can see or what uh, determines the acceptance criteria of the, um, of this, the pressure testing. So one thing that we just wanted to highlight here in section 5.9.1.3 is um, that there's an exception to the visible leakage. So for valves with adjustable stem seals or adjustable packing, leakage through the stem seals during the shell test shall not be cause for rejection. The manufacturer must show that the leak can stop. So maybe it's leaking into atmosphere uh, through the packing under test, but if they can tighten the, the packing down and show it's able to stop, then that would be accepted as a pass. The reason this exception is given is that it's recognized that valve packing must be adjusted from time to time. And by initially over tightening the packing, it can cause the force required to operate the valve to go up substantially and friction on the seals to be increased. And as a result, that can shorten the life of the sealing system. You don't want your testing to be hampering what's happening in the field. And, um, and that's something to, I, I think that you know, is worth being aware of. If your valve is never gonna see high pressures Maybe it's not the best thing to test it at pressures, you know, 50 or 100 times what it will actually experience. Okay, so moving on to the seat testing within API 598. Um, the seat or closure test for steel valves is 110% of the rated pressure at ambient temperature, maximum 100F, 38C. So remember going back to table one, valves are generally only required to have a high or a low pressure closure test. One of the tests is optional. The test fluid can be air or, um, or air or water. Sorry, air for um, the low pressure test and for the high pressure test it's um, with water or can be with uh, a clean gas. Um, within the closure test, there's also a requirement for bi-directional testing except for um, a couple of the, um, the exceptions listed here. So any valves that are marketed as unidirectional only need to be tested as such. Check valves are only tested in one direction for obvious reasons. And uh, a little bit strangely, category A, API 5609, resiliency to butterfly valves are only needed to be tested in a, a single direction, even though they, those valves are inherently bidirectional, but the standard doesn't require anything of them. Um, the thing to note though, is that not all valve types can seal bidirectionally. And they can't seal bidirectionally equally. So there's one preferred direction. And in the reverse flow, generally the isolation ability is impaired. Um, it's an important consideration and that's dependent on the valve type. For instance, a wedge gate seals equally from either side while a triple offset has a preferred isolation direction. That being said, Whatever the direction of isolation, a triple offset will provide tighter isolation than a wedge gate. So that's kind of going back to a valve invented during the Industrial Revolution, being a wedge gate and a valve invented in the 1960s approximately in the triple offset. And it's had improvements over that time. So, you know, not using the oldest technology is necessarily the best. And, um, but sometimes a wedge gate may, may suffice for the application. More likely than not, though, a, a triple offset would provide a different superior leakage. Okay, and so um, here's the final table that I'm gonna show from uh, API 598. 
Um, this table provides the allowance for allowable leakage. Again, resilient seated valves, zero across the board, which is something that we're gonna become familiar with. Um, but as you, as you will notice for metal seated valves, other than check valves, the leakage, leakage is actually zero up to two inch, okay? The only thing I'd note on that is it's zero, but the test duration is only 15 seconds. Is that long enough? I'm not sure. Um, I'd venture to guess in some applications it may not be, to, to be fully confident if you're expecting it to be zero leakage. Um, 15 seconds may not be long enough, especially under those ideal conditions. Above that size, the uh, leakage allowable is directly correlated to the valve size and goes up fairly, in a fairly straight line. Um, API 598 quant quantifies the leakage by drops or bubbles in a given period of time, minute in this instance. And so um, there's actually a, a conversion for those. And so one milliliter is equivalent to 16 drops and one milliliter is equivalent to 32 bubbles. So 16 drops is a milliliter and 32 bubbles is a milliliter, okay? Um, also, we can see that uh, check valves have a considerably higher allowable leakage rate than other valve types. So this is all valves except check, metal seated valves except check, and this is metal seated check valves. And so I think what, what my takeaway from that is that we need to remember that check valves are meant to be a safety device that prevents the backflow of liquid or media or gas, but they aren't meant to provide true isolation. Check valves need to be used in conjunction with an isolation valve for proper safety. Okay, and so now I'm gonna touch on uh, MSS SP61. So the scope of this standard is clearly specific to isolation valves or valves commonly used full open and full closed. Again, it, like the API 598, it covers the shell and seat testing. So speaking specifically to the, the shell testing, um, it's very similar to API 598, 598, except the test durations differ between these standards. In some sizes, SP61 has longer durations, but in general, you can say that API 598 has longer duration. Now that's in general, it's a couple sizes, that's not the case for. Um, I think it's specifically eight and 10 inch. So these are the, the called out durations within the standard. And similarly to what I was mentioning in API 598, you'll see here that the shell test duration for small valves is really very short at 15 seconds. And that, um, I mean, that, that's interesting of how short it is and interesting that some of our client base, uh, mainly in Alberta, who demand that all the valves being supplied are tested beyond these parameters and significantly beyond these parameters. And uh, that is to hold the, the shell test for a minimum of 10 minutes for all valves. Um, so just to kind of compare to API 598, the maximum time that uh, API 598 allows for leak it for shell testing is five minutes, and that's on uh, valves 14 inch and larger. Uh, so here it's three minutes for similarly sized valves, and API 598 is that two minutes longer. But again, we have um, numerous clients who, who demand 10 minutes, and uh, you know, uh, there's uh, other standards. I think mean, API 60 it takes it even longer um, for some sizes. That, that actually goes up to 30 minutes. So. Uh, definitely industry sees a requirement for some, um, some longer test durations, and, uh, but that is on the purchaser to, to specify that and demand it from the, the manufacturers that they're working with. Again, the shell testing is done with the valve in the partially open position. Okay, and now moving on to the seat testing for SP61. Um, Similar to what we've seen already, it's 110% uh, of the rated pressure at ambient temperature. So that's the same as uh, what 598 specifies. Um, for resilient seated valves, both standards are zero leakage again. Um, for metal seated valves, SP61 states 10 milliliters per hour per inch of valve size. NPS is nominal pipe size. Okay, so here the SP61 seat leakage is a bit easier to achieve 
than that of API 598. So another way to say that is there are higher leakage rates allowable in SP61 in comparison to API 598 as a general rule. Check valves are four times higher leakage allowable than metal seated valves. And so that, um, that's higher uh, as well in comparison to API 598. So my, um, my takeaway really from, from this is um, API 598 and MSS SP61 have a lot of similarities, but the string, stringency of API 598 is a little bit uh, higher than that of SP61. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to um, the FCI 70-2 testing. Um, really the first thing I want and main thing I wanna call out uh, in, in this is this uh, area that's been highlighted here. And I'll just uh, read a bit or paraphrase a bit of that. Hey ben, sorry to interrupt. I just wanna bring awareness to the time. So if you can just maybe focus on some of the more critical pieces here. Yeah. Um, really the, the thing I wanna cover in 70-2 is in 2003, one respondent asked for the standard to be modified to exclude, to specifically exclude on off valves. FCI 70.2 has been intended to apply to control valve seat leakage, and it goes on to say, recommend specifying another standard such as API 598, but it is strangely used for isolation valves when clearly about control valves. So um, that's the, the main takeaway I wanna take from 70-2. These are the different leakage classes that are allowable within it. Um, commonly seen are class four, class five, and class six. There's Details within these that need to be, we need to be cognizant of that I alluded to earlier. And those details can make class five actually be a more stringent test than class six. Um, but the real takeaway for me is that we should be using these leakage classes for modulating control valves, and we should be using another standard for isolation valves. Another standard is ISO 5208. Um, I'm just gonna to touch into the seat testing on, on this. And um, it's, this is an international standard. It's not used very uh, commonly in North America, although it, it is increasing. Um, follows many of the same standard uh, protocols, 150% for the shell testing and 110% for seat testing. Um, and again, like API 598 is dependent on the valve type and sizes. Um, and just looking at, this is the allowable leakage rates. It's quite an easy table to understand. These are the, the rates across the top and the corresponding leakage classes or the leakage amounts that are allowable multiplied by the DN size. So that DN size would be in millimeters. So clearly rate A, no visually, visually detectable leakage. So that would be your resilient seated generally, not to say a metal seated couldn't, um, couldn't do that if the manufacturer was able to. And then it goes down from there. Um, one, like I mentioned, ISO API 60 does reference back to this table, and it calls out rate A for resilient seated valves and rate D for metal seated valves. I think you will very commonly find if you buy a metal seated valve, rate D will be what you will be getting. Now, to get higher, you need to specify that, or it would be something that is marketed by that supplier. And here's one, I just this one chart that I mentioned, uh, you know, there's many similar ones that compare different leakage classes. And um, you'll see this one is kind of bending over the other ones. And um, that's that class six, where it's sometimes better and sometimes worse than others. But again, let's not use the uh, FCI 70-2 class four, five, six. Let's uh, use something like API 598 or ISO 5208. And that would be the key thing that I'd like people to take away from, uh, from that, uh, those section of slides. Ross? So so what happens when um, valves have a leak in an application that is challenging? This photograph uh, is of a valve that we uh, discovered had happened literally overnight. It, the valve didn't actually, it wasn't the fault of the valve. It was the fault of the actuator that was not able to put the energy on the closure part of it to keep it tight. Um, it was relaxed, a hydraulic cylinder and power po point uh, was Dis, disengaged from the power and so the cylinder degraded over the evening and the differential pressure inside the pipe eventually raised the gate enough to have a leak path which destroyed the bottom of that, that pipe. 
So energy is the, the, the problem that we have to deal with and it's differential energy and the type of valve and how well it, or it, how, how poorly it actually seals. We are, we are always trying to find um, how do we actually specify the right valve in the beginning. The next slide, please. So here's quick, quite common uh, damage that we see from the event when the, the, the closure member on the left is the plug was against the seat and it allowed an escape of energy. In this case, it's erosive, abrasive. More than likely, this is also some cavitation or flashing damage that's there. And as you can see, the more it happens, the more it opens up to an increasing leaks leak point. The point on the, uh, the valve on the right um, was a well-engineered product that unfortunately was put in backwards and not tight. And that allowed the abrasive action to scour away that the ball seat. Next one, please. For me personally, I've, uh, I've been involved with knife gate valves for most of my life. And the, the mystery to me is that um, there's, there's a subplot amongst all this, in, this talk is about the clear language. What are we talking about? Here, if you look carefully, you'll see five or maybe six, but it's the, the last two on the right are the same. There's five different varieties of knife gates. And the word knife to me means that it cuts. Well, the, the challenge is that only one of those five cuts, the others don't cut. The conventional knife gate wedges, the through gate carries a, a, an open port, open and closed through packing. The line valve is like a conventional, but with lined um, inside. The push through spreads the sleels. The only one that actually cuts is a guided shear gate. And yet all of them are knife gate valves. So if we choose an application that says, I want a knife gate valve, you're gonna, you possibly could get one of those five. One of them leaks 40 cc's per inch per, per minute if you have at least 40 PSI differential pressure. Is that an isolation valve? In my opinion, not, and it can really lead to some problems. So um, here, the next, yeah, next slide. So here we have uh, a test on this to be open and transparent. This is in the valve when it's in the reverse direction. The 40 cc's per inch diameter is much higher because we're testing it in its non-preferred direction. It's, it is not equal in, in, uh, in how it isolates. Next, please. So here is another aspect of a problem. This particular knife gate valve is a push through knife gate valve. It's actually a very well-made product. It tested zero leakage when it was at the factory. But here, because of the thickness of the gate and the stress on the sleeves, the valve in the open position are discharging free, what's called, what we call free discharge of the process fluid that they're trying to fill this 200 kilometer pipeline in Morocco with. And in Morocco, it's a desert. They don't have a lot of the water they want to fill the pipeline. So again, not a bad valve, a, an incorrect valve that might have tested to zero leakage, but isn't accurate and, or meaningful in this application. One more, please, slide. So, We've learned a little bit that uh, having tests in, in a factory to a valve test gives us some sense of security. We know the valve is not going to blow up or shouldn't, but it doesn't give us the tool we really should be looking for to install the proper valve in the application. It really has to be selected for the application. Then the test becomes more relevant and we can choose a better test. Next one, please. So I, 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 I focus my life on uh, problems rather than solutions because it's easier to, su to supply um, fixes when you know something's wrong. I, this is to me, uh, it's, it's a very interesting photograph that's showing again, the, a free discharge. In this case, this is acidic. It's 80 Celsius. It's very corrosive. It's four floors above uh, on a building that's in the Dominican Republic and it's spraying out while the valve is open. It's the wrong valve. And in this case, that's cost eight hours of time as the maintenance crew is, is telling you right here, which ended up about a million dollars in lost production. A million dollars for a valve that in this case was selected for 20 grand maybe. The proper valve should have been 30 grand. I would much rather have that million dollars back than waste worrying about that $10,000 extra money. Next slide, please. So uh, we mentioned a little bit a little, uh, before about bidirectionality. And in here is another 1960s invention, the triple offset valve. On the, on the picture on the left is the laminated seats that were designed into the disc itself when the original patent. Over time, the manufacturer or the patenter realized that, in, that when the valve was in the open position, that primary 
uh, sealing element was in the waterway and suspected to uh, or, or seen or whatever the fluid coming down the pipe was. So he moved it to the seat. And the newest ways of doing this valve is that laminated seat is protected by a seat insert, allowing the valve to survive longer in service. The original the design was that he was so sure that this could seal against 300 PSI steam that he gave a seven year guarantee, not a warranty free of defects, but a guarantee that the valve will be tight. And, and this is coming from Germany, tight to him meant zero leakage. Next, please. He did design four different sealing uh, uh, components for him. Two of them do seal zero leakage, two don't. The laminated seal is zero, and that's for high temperatures where a soft seal like a Teflon or a rubber can't work, but the soft seal is also tight, but it, obviously it's limited to temperature, 260 C, 500 uh, F perhaps. The other two are used, but they cannot give zero leakage. Next, please. This, uh, this graph is very um, strong in understanding what is tightness. And we, we've alluded to what tightness is. Uh, we still haven't given you the answer yet. But here, this manufacturer says, if you close this torque-seated valve 100% of the required amount, you're going to get bidirectional tightness. In other words, zero leakage from either side. If you reduce it by a bit, 10% or so, you'll get bidirectional tightness, but you'll lose the ability of it to be perfect. And again, as you go down, you get less and less. So understanding how valves operate and how you apply the, um, the, the valve in service can give you a very different isolation abilities. Next, please. In the uh, ball valve um, world, this is a, an innovative style of ball valve called uh, a non, this is not a floating ball, and it's not a trunnion, the two most common size. This is a fixed seat ball. The fixed seat ball was made possible by the development of carbides back in the 1970s and 80s. It wasn't available before because the pressure needed to force that ball onto the integral seat would have damaged the metals that were not hard enough. But with carbide, they're hard enough to stop that, that destruction um, of, the, of the applying such high force on there. And with this metal seat of valve, we can achieve zero leakage on gases like hydrogen or helium, very, very small molecules. But its principal use is on steam or on concentrate pipelines. Next, please. We, we, we keep learning lessons as we go. I, this picture for me was a very personal one where I was, um, I sold valves for anhydrous ammonia and anhydrous ammonia can, can change its, uh, its volume from a gas, or sorry, from a liquid to a gas by 850 times this volume. To safely do that in the system, you need to vent that, uh, that gas upstream. Well, we sold the valve and I was uh, brought up because he, I, I was said my valves are leaking on the test. When I got to the plant where they were testing it, I sort of smiled uh, in relief actually, because this is doing what exactly what it's meant to do. It's relieving the body cavity test. This is put in the wrong way. If it was put in the correct way, the unidirectional way, it would be venting upstream. Next, please. Check valves, we, we've told you already that they're not isolation valves, but they are important into stopping the reverse flow of, uh, of, of process. What some manufacturers have actually gone ahead and designed seats and seals that are tight. This manufacturer sends valves out that are drop tight to API 598. Next, please. So there's a couple of issues that we need to uh, address. There is no perfect valve. We are absolutely sure that the application will dictate which valve and valve technology is necessary. The valve tests themselves are only a small part of the journey to select the right valves. They are important, but they have to be kept into the, uh, what they're actually saying and what they're not saying. And the valve test results themselves should not be taken as insurance directly. Next, please. There, there is some work um, being done uh, that will develop another standard, a more challenging standard, because of how we've been dividing the world into severe service, fit for purpose, and general purpose. A severe service valve is going to need more testing to give more assurance to, to the client. We, we, do, we really have to understand what that valve needs to do. What does it function? And this is an area that over my lifetime, I've been very um, uh, 
challenged. I don't get on a data sheet, as uh, Ben was showing, enough information. I don't get the normal starting position. I don't get the number of cycles. Without knowing those things, I really can't use my skill, if I have one, to select the best technology. I think when you're in these more challenging areas, you really need to use somebody who's got the experience. We're, that's what we focused on for the last 20, 30 years. There's other people like us, obviously, that do the same thing, but you really need to go and challenge somebody who's got that experience. Next, please. So we have some, um, some tools that we can provide to you. We would ask you to start questioning your own systems. Are you, are you helping yourself? Um, these are available through SAM for sure. Next slide, please. The, uh, the, valve, the, the data sheet that we use, we unabashedly took it from ISA on the control valve side for sure. This is what we borrowed it for. But if you look carefully, you'll see some bolded areas. There's, there's 85 pieces of item, item uh, descriptions that are possible. We bolded 20. From those 20, we have enough data to be able to really use our skill set and say what is the best valve and technology for the application. But most importantly, 40, 44, 45, 46, those are the items where we really need to know um, what, what is that valve going to do as it's isolating in this time. Next slide, please. Thanks, Ross. I'll take over from here just quickly. Uh, again, thanks, guys, uh, Ben and Ross, for uh, taking us through that. Like I said at the beginning of the presentation, it's uh, uh, definitely a, a very long, in-depth uh, topic that we can get into. And unfortunately, being forced into an hour, we had to uh, rush through some of that. But uh, uh, these last two slides, um, Sam will be sending out um, an email afterwards, and we'll uh, provide this uh, leakage standard um, comparison chart that we've put together. Again, it's just uh, sort of an overview uh, focusing on that seat leakage for uh, of the test that we, we discussed. Um, and um, yeah, we really hope that uh, you got some good information. I do want to spend a few minutes if there's any other questions uh, to be able to answer those. So if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to uh, put those in the chat um, and uh, we are happy to answer that. As I said as well, Ross, Ben, myself, our emails are on the uh, screen there. Uh, if you have to run and would like to uh, send us an email or have further discussions, please uh, here, uh, here to help and uh, happy to answer some questions. So uh, at that point, again, Ross, Ben, thank you so much. Uh, open up the, uh, the chat now to any questions. All right. Is there a preferred standard for utility water wastewater isolation valve applications? Uh, it's a, it's a it's a good one because uh, to me the, um, the the water itself quality is the unknown. We know what H two O is, but what's in it? Is there fiber? Is there dissolved solids? And and uh, again, this is coming from really exploring the application. What am I supposed to do? I recall years ago seeing a data sheet that said uh, the fluid was brine. When I went to the Atacama Desert to where they're extracting the uh, lithiums and, and borons from the brine, the pipe, uh, the 10 inch pipe that was exposed had a one inch thick scale. That was the brine precipitation. So in my brain, the, the media said brine is a liquid, but it isn't a liquid. It is a liquid with dissolved solids that in this case came out. So from, from is there a preferred standard? I. I think, again, my preference would be to test uh, ISO 5208. I always prefer to go to zero leakage or the tightest shutoff as as, a, as an initial place. It's not that it costs you more always to do that. It's just you have to select the right valve. But to do it properly and over time, we need to know what could happen to the wastewater. Is it primary sewage? Is it, is, it, uh, is it just recycled water? Is it got high chlorides? All those details have to go in there to select the right, first of all, materials so they don't corrode. And if they do have solids of any form, a fiber, a string, uh, a deposit, then we, we figure out how does that going to affect the future isolation. Uh, another question. Uh, can you explain the difference between uh, a seat and a shell test in a little bit more detail? Just, uh, uh, ben, do you want to do that or do you want me to? Yep, I can. Um, so the, the shell, I think the primary thing to think about is the shell test is done with the ceiling member open or partially open, whereas 
the seat test is done or the closure test or seat test is done with the closure member fully closed. So in ball valve, the, the ball is fully engaged into the seat uh, for the, the closure test. The closure test is generally done at about 110% of the rated pressure, whereas the shell test is done to 150%. The, the so this that's I'd say that's the main thing is if the valves are open or closed. Does that um, does that help? You want to add, Ross? Uh, I say th I think it's important to understand that the the shell test is a loss of containment test. You you're uh, you're protecting yourself by testing 50% above the maximum pressure you could ever be used at. And, and, and very rarely are you ever gonna be in a system where you're, you, you're actually used. The real um, pressures are at that 100% of what the class allows. So that extra 50% is that extra margin of safety for the loss of containment of the pipeline itself of which the valve is part of. This C test uh, being only 10% higher, it's not as maybe, um, as assuring, but the reality again, it's because you don't really run a valve to its full class, it's maybe 70% of the class or lower, you've got that range of, uh, of uh, protection. And then you have to worry, what does that through leakage do to me downstream? A lot of times, and I don't ever uh, want to, to seem that every valve has to be a severe service valve, it doesn't. My tap in my kitchen, that's a valve, it's pretty easy, it's water, it's 80 PSI. I don't operate it very often. Uh, if it leaks a bit, my wife is probably gonna get after me to put in a new washer, but it's not gonna be critical in many, many cases. Maybe it floods my kitchen, that'd be bad. But if that valve is on an acid, a uh, very aggressive acid or, or H2S, where very few PPM can kill people, then the, the consequence of leakage is so much higher. Braden, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, a couple more questions. As for uh, Alberta Occupational Safety and Health, a single isolation is acceptable provided professional engineering review the process. Uh, the single valve shell obtain uh, the no leakage as per the seal tightening criteria. So my question is, what can be considered the seal tight valves when you have so many different options for seat leakage but might not be available for maintenance or operation staff it, it's a it's a complicated uh question a good one um so we're in the in the definition of soft seat which is also in resiliency uh we're, we're we've got plastics like teflon nylon we've got elastomers um, viton epdm buna and a whole bunch and all of those have their own you know, inherent range of, of uh, applicability. So when the very beginning of it, we talked about this uh, invention by Howard Freeman, uh, the James Revolve valve. He was the first to apply PTFE or Teflon um, as a seat material in a, in a valve, in a, in a floating ball valve. And it was, um, it was practically, well, it became practical to offer a zero leakage valve in an environment that went up to around 260 Celsius. Um, beyond that, the, the Teflon got too soft and couldn't be used. So we have this temperature layer above, we uh, maybe peak is the highest temperature soft material we can use. Above that, you've got to use metal. And in the past, as we saw in the standards, unless you're two inch or less, metal seated valves have allowable leakage rate. Well, if, if you're trying to um, get a point, get, get a valve, a single isolation point to not not leak and you're in high temperature, you're stuck unless you use a technology that is beyond that allowable leakage rate. And there are, there, there's no question that metal seated valves are available that don't leak, zero leakage, even on things like hydrogen. Right. Um, next question, what is the most common application of laminated seats? Uh, it was invented for steam. Uh, the inventor, um, Ad Adams, was a power engineer in Germany, despite his English sounding name, he was German. He, uh, he, want, he was upset that um, uh, the current types of valves used in those days, wedge gates, 
parallel slides, weren't zero leakage. And he knew that steam, differential steam, was erosive. Wire, we, we use the word today wire drawing. If a valve is closed and steam gets by it, it cuts a path. Well, his laminated seats were made out of stainless steel alloyed with titanium for flexibility and, re, and me, re, memory. And then in between was the laminations were graphite. And so these three or four or five laminations gave uh, a, a different opportunity to seal against the, um, the, the disc and provide, in his words, tightness. Again, his word tightness means zero leakage. When the valve was closed, there was absolutely no steam going downstream. And that's why he got the confidence to be able to say, you put it on 300 PSI steam, saturated or whatever, and I will give you a seven year operating guarantee that it won't leak. Now, I don't think he probably put into that guarantee how many times am I going to cycle, but let's say it's one uh, once a week. That, that's very achievable. Yeah, we're also seeing um, the laminated seats uh, because of some of the manufacturers are able to achieve that zero leakage are starting to use them in um, um, some more dirty water applications, especially with the Adams design and the, the, the laminated seat in the body. Uh, we can get up to three or 4% solids in the, uh, in your process water and uh, still isolate uh, zero leakage on, on those applications. So um, yeah. again, in those severe services where resilient seed or soft seats uh, aren't usable, uh, the laminated seat is a, is a good option. At the point. That's a good point, Brayden, and I forgot to mention that, that over the years, I, I'm uh, opinionated, unfortunately, and, and I just don't like wedge gates. I don't think they're useful anymore. And I, if I owned a plant, I would get rid of them all. And a few years ago in the oil sands, I was wondering why they were using large diameter wedge gates in process water. Uh, I, I went to them, I challenged them, why are you doing this? Especially ones that are automated. And after a while, CNRL was the first, they said, mm, maybe you got a point, and they started to switch out. And lo and behold, we've got a way better, half the, half the weight, a third of the volume, and in big valves, actually cheaper. How do you get a new technology that's cheaper than an old technology? But it had to be in big valves, 24, above 24 inch. And the small stuff, they're a commodity. They're just pumped out by everybody. Uh, all right, Eric, got another couple of questions. How, can you describe how the packing is tested in API 598? Is that, do you think that's specific to that, the backseat test or? Um, I don't know, possibly, my, my the way I read it is uh, the fact that probably because it's allowed to uh, leak. Um, so, yeah, Ben, do you want to take that or do you want to? Yeah, well, um, so the, the exception within API 598 is that the, it, it can be leaking out the packing to atmosphere as long as it's demonstrated that it is able to be stopped. So the expectation on the manufacturer during that test would be to tighten down the packing sufficiently to pass the test for the, the stated period of time. So if it was a one inch valve, that would be 15 seconds for a 16 inch valve, that would be five minutes. So, the, so once, it, once the packing has been tightened and it's been shown for the, that the leakage is stopped, then that clock would start for the uh, stated period of time that's required. So, um, so that, that answers kind of what the exception is. And then um, there, the packing is tested or I suppose the, the backseat test is a different thing that's done that is regardless of the packing specific to the gate and globe valve. So that's kind of sort of a caveat on the side of it. Um, hope that answers the question. I, I, I just, too, like, if you look at our, um, for example, the, the DSF, DSS knife gate valve that has a uh, transverse seal uh, in that uses, that prevents the packing leak, if you will. Um, it, the, it's adjustable packing. We, we tend to, even though the valve is fully rated to ASME, um, in applications where we don't need to overpack uh, to extend the longevity of the, the packing, we won't fully pack that down. And so uh, whether it's being tested at the factory or when we first install it, you may see some weepage out of the packing. And that's what I think that standard is saying is that that's not uh, grounds to, um, uh, to reject the valve because you can go and adjust the packing and get that, uh, that isolation to stop. And so, um, you know, if, it's, uh, if you were to go and witness test uh, a batch of valves at, at the factory, um, you may want to prove to yourself or have the you know, client prove to themselves that, uh, that it can be shut off, but then subsequent valves, you would probably allow that, uh, that bit of weepage out of the packing to, to pass, knowing that in, once installed, you can, uh, you can have that weaker stop. And many different valve types have that uh, adjustability within the packing. And 
over packing a valve, especially at the very beginning of its life, causes uh, de deleterious effects to the valve. Um, like when the seals become as set as they can, so you, it gives you less future um, compression ability. It also gives, it increases the uh, forces required to operate the valve, be that torque or, or thrust, depending on the uh, type of valve. And as a result, maybe the actuator was sized for a relatively low pressure, but now you're forcing the valve to be a higher pressure valve. And so, um, so it's, that, that's why that uh, detail is within the specification. Yep, and just to add in general, um, valves that are rotary are easier to have um, to pack and to have less problems with stem leakage than linear valves. And it's just because of the way that the, um, the stem is moving through the packing. Right. Uh, right. Uh, there is quite a few, few other questions, so we'll try to keep answering them. I know we're over time here, but uh, we'll continue to uh, answer them. And uh, if you don't get to your question, we'll definitely answer it uh, by email. But uh, we'll keep going here, and feel free to jump off if you need to. Um, are the seats and shell pressure tests performed on each valve, or if the standard allows for few samples being tested from each valve? So. Uh, can you sample test or do you uh, pass that's, test or do you? Uh... The, 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 that's a good question that you have to look at the manufacturer. It, it's supposed to be every valve. We have seen cases where it's done a sample a batch, but um, again, maybe if we look at it from the three criticalities of valves where their importance is, severe service, it has to be every valve. Uh, fit for purpose, it has to be every valve general purpose or what I used to call a commodity, maybe you can get away with batch testing, but that would be between the buyer, the specifier and the manufacturer. But to the, to the letter of the standard, they all have to be tested. Yep. Uh, all right, if check valves usually has a leakage rate, uh, is it really required to provide a thermal relief across a check valve or will it relief, uh, relief thermally? So you're talking uh, now. You're talking on the a boiler application. So maybe a stop check or something. Is I that would assume so? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, like you're talking these big, um, maybe the, the the liquid is uh, boiler boiler feed uh, fluid, and it could flash. That that is a a design of the type of knife. Uh, sorry, a type of check valve. So um, if there has a cavity that has a ability to trap a a, a uh, part of the flu process, you're going to have to consider what is that, what could it do? What could the process do? Could it flash? And in that case, you might be using it. But there's other types of check valves that you don't have to, like a, a single flapper, an API 594, there's not enough volume or flow in there to, to be a captured place. Mm -hmm. I think just as a sidebar too, I think that's one of the main issues we run into with uh, in the valve industry and selection is that the general term check valve, knife data, as Ross said, you know, even butterfly valve, uh, there's such a wide range of types and, and um, functionality and, and performance that um, you really have to be careful and, and get to the nuance again of that application and, and look at the type of valve that you're putting in there because uh, you're right, uh, some types of check valves, you know, eight valves in particular, would usually need a thermal relief to, um, to make sure it doesn't seize or uh, cause that shock downstream. Um, whereas you can sometimes get away with not using one in a, a triple offset butterfly valve for steam with a, um, or a, a different type of valve. So it really, really reflects that. I think it's a good point you make there, Braden, to really call out not just the, the general valve type like ball valve or knife gate valve, but to be more specific of saying a guided shear gate valve or a trunnion ball valve. And it, it changes the parameters and the expectations of that, that um, product massively. Right. Another one here. Um, four more here, guys. If max DP test breakout is required during the FAT, will leak test be after or before the different standards? Uh, I think that the valve inherently will have a factory test and then arrive wherever it's going to be uh, tested, whether that's at the factory or uh, at the distributor or the automator. So there, there could be, again, I think it's between the client as well. Um, in the case of the oil sands companies, Suncor, CNRL, um, Curl, I think they're all agreed that they want to see a longer duration um, test for the continuity of the, of the pressure boundary. So we have to do that in addition to the factory test. It's already done and this is the second one. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Is it uh, practical to specify FCI 70-2 for isolation valve testing for leakage rate on off service on data sheet, or is it better to default to API 598 or MSS SP60? I would for sure eliminate FCI 70.2 from anybody's isolation description. Uh, it's a past historical anomaly. The, te the, 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 um, the document is called allowable leakage rates for control valves. It's for control valves. Let's not use it for isolation. It's been a challenge to me personally. Why don't we have one for isolation valves? And I put it to MSS, and there is talk of trying to do it. In fact, for a few years, um, MSS and FCI, 70, FCI themselves, Fluid Controls Institute, were uh, thinking of joining forces. Didn't happen. But while it was, um, they were talking, somebody made the suggestion, let's do class eight to identify a zero leakage isolation valve and build it into FCI 70.2. It didn't happen. So we're, we're there. So let's leave FCI 70.2 for control valves, FCI 70.3 for regulators, and another standard for isolation valves. Mm -hmm. I think we'd recommend that be API 598 or ISO 5208. Yes. That, that would be where I would recommend um, writing your standards around. Yeah, but it, it's amazing how many, how often you see, you know, uh, valve both from the manufacturer side as well as from the uh, the client specifying side. How often those standards are they're used? They just become a part of our our world, um, and likely because of the control valve influence. But uh, uh, we really recommend, especially in severe service applications, that uh, we're looking at those uh, those tighter uh, standards. And and so, FCI seventy point two really is just is generally most of the requirements are just the. Testing at 50 psi. So, yeah, class six. Yeah, it's a it's a very low energy system, and it's with with air. Um, you know, it's just it's being with us, and uh, it's like and it's like saying 150 pound when you're and when you're actually referring to class 150. They both have that 150 in them, but they're very different. I, I, again, I have a fairness gene in me and it bothers me when I lose. I lost an order because I, I quoted class 300. The guy that won the order sold a 300 PSI valve. Well, the difference is quite a bit. My valve could handle 740 PSI, class 300. His could handle 300 PSI. They're different. Obviously, one's cheaper. When the valve was put in, in service, oh, it didn't work because the actual uh, pressures was 40 atmospheres, 550 PSI. That's where we got to get rid of this language that's uh, left over from the from years ago, and it doesn't mean anything. Um, is there any standard or testing that can provide leakage rate versus number of cycles for severe service with suspended solids, for example? Great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. There are um, there's a couple of manufacturers who have really targeted severe service, and in this case, it was be oil and gas or mining, so concentrate pipelines, tailings, slurry pipelines, and have gone the extra mile and tested their valve under slurry conditions. We, in fact, um, wanted to prove what we were talking about, and we hired AITF in Alberta and Devon to do a slurry test on two technologies, one uh, metal seat of ball valve and one guided shear gate on the tailings um, that were possible out of the oil sands. So we selected the very fine material tailings and we selected the very coarse material tailings and had AITF do an actual test for us, 180 cycles on each of those two ends of the spectrum for size distribution. Just to know, could we achieve the same isolation rate at the end, at the beginning? And the answer is yes, we can. We learned uh, one, one of the tests we did was a success and was zero after 360 cycles. The other one wasn't a success, but we learned what happened to it. And we fixed the problem, we changed the technology, and now it works quite as well. So you, don't, you won't be able to use a standard test that's, uh, that we've identified today on the four. Um, you might be able to use that as a test result, but you've got to design your own criteria, and it's necessary for sure. Who wants to um, put a valve in a slurry pipeline moving at four meters per second, carrying 60% magnetite uh, ore that's, you know, the size of, of a beach sand? It's, that's a pretty challenging thing if you're going to cycle against it. So you have to have some experience in, in that actual um, or closeness to that, what you're going to expect in the field. Thank you. Next question, uh, can API 598 be used for API 60 valves? Um, so I just looked at the uh, six and all this. 
here and then open up to you guys. But uh, API 60, uh, the standard, uh, the latest version does reference um, ISO 5208. Uh, so for lubricated plugs and soft seated valves, uh, reference the acceptance criteria is at rate A. And then for uh, metal seated valves, uh, it references ISO 5208 rate D. So that's the standard within 6D. Now, um, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but oftentimes we will see multiple standards being requested. And um, again, sort of a hybrid test uh, uh, can be requested. And uh, um, so, if, you know, if you're the client asking for, uh, you want your valve to be uh, meet API 6D, but also test with API 598, uh, you, can, you can ask that. But uh, if you just ask for 6D, you would be getting the ISO 5208 uh, uh, test standard. Yeah, and it's interesting that API 60 references ISO 5208, and that you know that speaks to the <laughs> speaks to the fact that I think that the that ISO 5208 standard is is coming up and up more, and like you mentioned, it's used a lot internationally, and I think we should uh, look to start adopting that here in uh, in the marketplaces we, we, we're working in. That'd be my recommendation generally, especially. Not the SCI 70-2. Uh, I think a couple last ones. Uh, for fit for purpose or even commodity valves, does manufacturers typically keep records for the testing? Um, what's on the record? Uh, only go, no go, or if they also record the leakage rate, pressure gauge, traceability, test pressures, etc. Uh, it's a it's a nebulous answer because all manufacturers uh, have their own systems, but the ones that we use in North America, Europe. Um, Korea that we know of and we've used for years. Again, from our stance, we're, we're approaching the world from the top down rather than the bottom up. They all keep records for a, a long, a long time. They may be paper in the old days. Uh, today, it's all digitized. I'm sure you can go back with a serial number and or PO number, an item number, and get uh, a copy of the test certificate. It might cost you some money to to get it uh, the second time because they're usually sent out the first time. Uh, and, and again, that's another question or another point. Some manufacturers are, they're automatic. You get your test certificates with the valve without even asking or paying for it. Others, you got to pay. So you may get a copy with the valve up to, uh, again, up to you. Do you need it or not? Yeah, it's kind of just looking through some of the test standards to see if there's any reference in it on requirements on, uh, you know, there's a requirement to do the test, but uh, it's a quick, quick review of them. It doesn't show like there's any I can share a kind of an, an awkward um, observation that was made when we were at uh, a valve, a global valve show in uh, Dusseldorf a couple of years ago. Um, as a presenter, you get to go in and talk to all the other presenters and, and, and just amongst ourselves for a luncheon. And one of the presenters there was the uh, chief of quality for, um, and he, he said this is public, so I'm allowed to say it. He was the, the chief of quality for uh, Dow Europe. And he, uh, he asked the question of the audience, what percentage of um, documents do we get a, for, of, of the valve, the MTRs, the test certificates, he said that, what percentage of those are, are correct? And I, I sort of put my hand up and said, well, 99.8%, you, you buy only from the best, best in the world. And everybody was pretty well around that less than 1% failure. Well, um, the answer shocked all of us. He said 35% of our documents are not accurate. Not accurate. They could be fraudulent. They could be mistaken. They could be whatever. It was a shocking revelation. So he's, he's had to pump up his QA on the receipt. He's gone back and done a lot of checking. And there's been some, um, some unhappy customers or unhappy suppliers that uh, maybe weren't as accurate as they should have been with their documentation. I'll just uh, put in there too. I think it also really depends on the valve. You know, uh, for example, we, we sell a lot of resiliency to butterfly valves in, in those general purpose applications. And um, rarely would we get a, uh, a test report um, with that. Now you can, you can order them up front and, and ask for them. Um, but depending on the manufacturer, it's sometimes difficult to go back, uh, even though uh, they are supposedly testing them 100% um, at the factory. So uh, whereas, like Ross said, with a, a metal suited knife gate or sorry um, a knife gate or a uh, metal seat of ball valve or triple offset uh, um, they are 100 testing them and usually those come with the uh, certificates 
Yeah, I think it's a good idea uh, that we should actually research that a little bit because it's, it, it, I, I don't know the answer. Um, and Kevin has just uh, pointed out. So let's, let me, let's come back to everybody on that. I'd like to, I'd like to learn. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. I think that uh, Kev had one last one in the oil and gas industry. Where can you use triple offset products? Uh, Kevin, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I, I would target it wherever there was a wedge gate, certainly on uh, custody transfer, it's tighter than a wedge gate. So on every every um, storage container, I'd for sure use it. The, the, the way I look at these things is I look at it, where couldn't I use it? So the, the, the problem comparing a triple offset to what it should be replacing like a wedge gate is that uh, the disc is 100% in the waterway no matter what position it's in, fully open, fully closed. There's always part of the valve in the waterway. That's a pressure drop. Uh, cost is there is there enough energy in the system that that's irrelevant probably in most cases it always is you know you have control valves and systems to to absorb that waste energy and and, and reduce it the the absorbing a little less energy is no big deal for control valve might even be better for it so but I want to ask that question will the will the um, will they be picking the line if they're picking the line I can't use the triple offset um, but on all of the auxiliary uh, components of, the, of that system using thermal systems like steam, I, it's a way better valve for sure. And then again, um, what is the maximum amount of solids it can handle? In my own belief, it's less than 5% solids, suspended solids. If I have dissolved solids, I can take a bit more because I know uh, being a torque seated valve, I can actually apply that closing torque and cut through the scale that may be built up on the body. But I, I won't probably put it in and again, maybe seven or 8% dissolved solids. Uh, there's better technologies for the dirtier services out there. Perfect. Well, I uh, think that's all the questions and uh, really appreciate the time for uh, all those that have uh, stuck around. Thank you so much. Um, keep an eye out. We will be doing a few more of these over the next uh, few months. So. Uh, interested please uh, sign up for those ones and uh, again to Ben Ross thank you so much for your time and have a great day guys just maybe a quick close in is there if there's any kind of topic that is of attraction um, please let us know we we really do like getting involved and uh, and and finding out what people want to know about um, we've been so focused on vows that sometimes you forget the general stuff that's out there so if you've got a topic that's of interest, please let Sam know and uh, we'll, put a, we'll put another presentation together. Great. And we'll be sending out those resources. That's right. Great. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you. So much, guys. Thanks. Bye.